uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today we are going to talk about um, how to migrate a Spring Boot 1 application developed with Java to Spring Boot 2 uh, with the Kotlin language. So I'm Sebastian Deleuze, I'm working as a Spring Framework Committer at Pivotal. I'm mainly working on the web, reactive, and Kotlin stuff. And I'm Mark Heckler, I'm a Spring Developer Advocate. I kind of uh, travel everywhere and talk to anyone who'll listen about the uh, wonders of Spring. So. So let's start. Uh, current session will be mainly live coding, but we are going to start with a little bit of context. So Spring Love Kotlin and officially supports it. Uh, that means that we support the Kotlin language in various parts of the Kotlin of the Spring ecosystem. Uh, Spring Framework 5 officially supports Kotlin. I announced that at the beginning of the year with a lot of nice feedback from the community. So it, it seems to raise some attention. But there is also Kotlin support in Reactor Core 3.1, uh, Spring Data K, and Spring Boot 2, which be, will be released at the end of the year. So today we are going to uh, provide you some demo with uh, Millestone and Snapshot of Spring Boot 2, but uh, it's, it's reaching, it's not very far from the release. So the first one, uh, the first step will be uh, migrate from Java to Kotlin. So in this uh, step, we are going to start with an already developed Spring Boot application in Java. And we are just going to change the language. We take no advantage of the special uh, Kotlin support feature that's really to show you how you develop uh, an application with Kotlin with no special features in Spring for that. Then uh, Mark will show you how to migrate from Spring Boot, Spring Boot 1, which has no specific support for, for Kotlin, to Spring Boot 2, which is based on Spring Framework 5 and which, which integrates some specific Kotlin feature. Then we are going to use a new uh, Web, Webflux framework, which is a non-blocking reactive framework, uh, which is available in Spring Framework 5. So we are going to migrate from Spring MVC to Spring Webflux uh, while keeping the same annotation-based programming model. And with the last step, uh, we are going to show uh, how to use the new Spring Webflux functional API, which may be more idiomatic in Kotlin, and we will show some specific Kotlin DSL to develop your web application. So let's switch to the code. OK, so this is the application I'm going to show. Uh, I can show you. It's a blog, it's a blog application. So that's a simple blog post application where I, I display some blog posts. Uh, we deal with blog posts and users. Uh, we display the dates. You can watch specific um, articles. So that's a very simple application. And we are going to use this application to demonstrate how um, we can migrate from a Java application to a Kotlin application. Uh, so you can see that we have Uh, we have a domain model, so we have posts with the various fields, uh, two constructors, uh, getters, setters, equals, hash code, to string. The same for user. We have two repositories that are using uh, Spring Boot, uh, Spring Data, uh, MongoDB. We have a regular um, Spring Boot Java code, okay, and uh, some controllers. One is for uh, the HTML views, and the two others are for the REST controllers. OK, so it seems like it's a regular Spring Boot application. And we are going to migrate it to, um, uh, to Kotlin. So the first thing to change, so here is the Gradle build, OK? Uh, quite simple. So I am going to switch to another branch that will just provide me the, the right thing for, yeah. So um, what is the difference uh, against a regular Java application? We have the Kotlin Gradle plugin, okay, which is a plugin which enables the Kotlin compilation. We have also two other plugins, the Kotlin All Open and the Kotlin Noir plugin. I will talk about these two later. Um, you see that I have here some compilation because by default, Kotlin compiler generates Java 6 bytecode. 
So since we are, uh, I, I guess we can use uh, Java 8 bytecode, so we, comp we configure that. Be careful, you have to configure that for both uh, compile and compile test, okay? So don't forget to, to add the, these two, two compilation options. And then we have the Kotlin stdlib GRE 8. So if we have a look to the dependencies, uh, let me just update it. Okay. So if we have a look to the dependencies, so you see that we have Just show you that. So we have three stdlib uh, dependencies. The first one is the um, library that is common to uh, Java 6, Java 7, and Java 8. So it will contain most of the Kotlin standard library. Okay. Then um, we have this other dependency which contain only Java 7 uh, specific API and extensions. And then we have the GRE uh, 8 which contain uh, Java 8 specific APIs. And when you import uh, stdlib GRE um, 8, it will transitively import uh, the two other ones. So in practice, when you are using this dependency, the stdlib GRE 8, it will import the three others and you don't have to care. Uh, when you use Kotlin and Spring, you have to use the Kotlin-reflect uh, dependency. And um, also, since we are not providing any Kotlin support in Spring Boot 1, you have to use the Jackson module Kotlin, which is mandatory to serialize and deserialize uh, data classes, for example, in Kotlin. Uh, everything of this configuration is available in uh, start.spring.io. So if you go to start.spring.io and uh, select Kotlin, uh, Kotlin project, that will generate this configuration already ready for you, so you don't have to care about it. Uh, we, we provide native support for Kotlin in start.spring.io. Now, uh, we have that, and we are going to migrate progressively this application from Java to Kotlin. So, I'm going to start. So, uh, it's uh, Kotlin. Um, we are using the Kotlin um, uh, directory instead of the Java one. I'm going to update the Gradle configuration. Okay, and I'm going to convert manually the first file. So, the extension in Kotlin is KT instead of Java. Okay, so you can see this, the little icon that specifies that we are here in a, in a Kotlin class. So, what are the differences? Uh, in Kotlin, classes and methods are by default public. So, I remove uh, the public keyword, which is not useful. Uh, I'm using to create a data class. So a data class in Kotlin will automatically uh, generate equals hash code to string and provide values of our facilities like a copy method that we will um, use later. And then you will see that a such class is much more shorter in Kotlin than in Java. So we are going to keep our fields, but we are going to uh, put directly properties in Kotlin. So I can use var or val. Var is for mutable properties, val is for immutable properties. In my Java version, I'm using mutable properties because that's what usually people do, uh, because if you don't do that, you have some issues with Jackson and other things like that. In Kotlin, uh, I am not using, uh, going to use var, I'm going to use uh, val, immutable properties, because that's more idiomatic and because uh, the Jackson Kotlin support, for example, allows us to, to do that. So I'm going to use uh, immutable classes everywhere for my domain model. So let me continue to convert. The type is suffix, so instead of putting the, the type here in Kotlin, I put it there. Uh, and I'm going to do the same for each property, so I get the type. Notice that the semicolon in Kotlin is optional, and uh, it's more idiomatic to not have any semicolon, so at the end, I will do a big search and replace to remove every semicolon. But yeah, you can use it or not use it. I advise you to not use any semicolon in Kotlin. That's not needed. And your code will look more beautiful without it. I'm changing every properties. Okay. 
So this syntax is a short one, uh, similar to what there is in Scala, which uh, provides the ability to declare at the same time the properties and the constructor. So by, by writing that, I'm declaring the various properties, but I also uh, declare a primary constructor, which will be used to create the various uh, instances of my post um, class. Author user. Okay, user. I usually forget that one, not sure why. Okay, and now I'm going to remove all the Java source code. So, ooh, bye bye. Um, so, obviously, that's, that's shorter. Um, our IDE allows us to, to write the Java class code quite fast because we have a lot of auto generating options. The, the big difference in, is where you read the code, when you maintain it, when you have to debug it, it's just another world. So, in terms of speed of writing, that's a little bit more better, but really in, the big difference is in terms of debugging, reading the code, etc. Um, so, that's it. Uh, notice that I can provide uh, some default uh, optional parameter with default values. So here, for example, we can think that uh, we would like to set the default to local that time now uh, when we don't specify uh, these uh, this properties. And in Java, I would have to write uh, an overloaded constructor with different parameters. Here, I can use the same one and just write local that time that uh, now, and that means that when I will not specify the last parameter, it will automatically get the no uh, value, and we can see that in terms of semantics, the code uh, reads pretty well. So that's optional parameters with, with um, default values. For user, I could do the same thing. I will just show you that in ID there is some uh, Java to Kotlin conversion thing, so that's not perfect. You will have to modify the code after that, but I will use that several times uh, today. So you can see that it does a part of the job, but uh, when you compare both, obviously I still have some works to make it more idiomatic. So I'm using data class. You, you can totally um, write that. I mean, if you don't care about generating um, uh, equals hash code and to string, you can totally do that. Um, but here, we will use that later. So, data class user. So, notice that uh, I will continue to use the same short notation. So, id var login. You see that here I have a question mark. So, a key point of Kotlin is that it deals, it natively supports uh, null safety in its type system. That means that in, in Java, when you work with Java, when you have a, a parameter, a field, or something like that, you don't know what is the nullability. So you have to read the Javadoc. Maybe your framework or library has specified it in the Javadoc, maybe not. If not, you have to guess if that's nullable or not. And that's why we have null pointer exceptions. Uh, and that's why uh, in Java, the null safety is checked at runtime. Uh, in Kotlin, null safety is still a thing but it is checked at compile time. So you don't have to wait to have your application in production to get this nice uh, uh, exception at the worst uh, time, usually. It's, you have to deal with null safety, but during the compilation. And what we, tr we try to do when we build some Kotlin application, we try to, so null, null fields and properties and parameters are not a bad thing, but when we can uh, avoid uh, null properties, we will, we will do. So here, uh, login is mandatory, so I will use, so that means that that's a non-nullable string, and with the question mark, that means that uh, login could be null. So here, login will be always specified. I said that I'm using uh, nullable, uh, immutable values. Well, um, here, I'm also using non-nullable first name. Non-nullable last name and the description. We could think that the description is not mandatory. So I will keep the nullable string for description and I will have a default value which is null. And I remove all this code. 
Okay. So when you come from Java world and myself, when I begin to work uh, with Kotlin two years ago, um, it, it sounds not super important to me, even if I, I care about new pointer exception, but when you, you develop some time with, with Kotlin, you really, um, you really see the added value of that. And we will, we will see that later, but that's nice to be able to check that at uh, compile time uh, rather than at, at runtime. For the interfaces, that's almost the same. So I change the extension, I remove the public keyword. Uh, instead of extends, I'm using colon, okay? And I don't have to provide the body if there is not. And I think that's it. I can obviously also use um, conversion facilities to do that. I think it's pretty great. Now, uh, now we are going to migrate our um, application class to Kotlin. So later, Mark will show um, um, a version that will use the native support of Kotlin in Spring Boot uh, 2. So now uh, be aware that I'm just using Spring Boot 1, which provides no specific Kotlin extensions, and the code will be more idiomatic when uh, we will use uh, Spring Boot 2. Uh, something that there is in, in Kotlin, uh, which is not present in Java, is top-level functions. So in Kotlin, you don't have to wrap your functions in a class if you don't need to. That means here, the main method, we are going to be able to, to move it as a top-level function uh, outside the application class. So I take this code, I move it here. In Kotlin, the functions are declared with the fun keyword, okay? Maybe that means something. Uh, we don't need a public. We don't mean, we don't need static void. So, oh, let me, um, let me change that to Kotlin. Okay. So, so fun keyword, I declare the, na the name of the function. I still have a string array, but it is declared as an array of string. Okay, but that's, that's the same. Here, uh, we keep for the moment spring application dot run. Uh, here, uh, when we write first in Kotlin, to get the class, you are using this notation to get the, the meta information of the class. And application uh, dash dash uh, um, semi colon colon class is the Kotlin class. So in, in order to be able to access to the, um, the real uh, Java class, I'm using that. I'm using the spread operator to change the args parameter, which is an array, to, to a var args, because my here, I'm taking a varags of string. I'm removing the public keyword because I don't need that. And in terms of imports, um, you don't have to specify the, the static keywords when you are using uh, static imports. Uh, here I'm declaring a moustache compiler bin because I want to customize the, the configuration of um, uh, the moustache support to not escape the HTML in the, in the template system. So I'm going to move the return type at the end, okay? I do the same for the parameter. Okay, I'm going to change that into a function, so I still use fun and the semicolon is optional. So that's, that works, but I can provide a better syntax. Uh, in, in, in Kotlin, in addition to the null safety, which is a super important feature, you have type in France. So Kotlin is much more clever than Java to guess uh, the type of your classes and your methods. Um, an important thing to understand is that Kotlin is as statically typed as Java. Uh, so that's very, even if the syntax looks um, concise like groovy, 
it's as statically typed as Java. And I would say uh, Kotlin is e even more statically typed than Java because it has null safety. And null safety is a kind of a step, additional step toward the, the null safety of your code. So instead of writing that, I can directly use a short notation, uh, which is useful for one-liners function, which is equals. And I return directly uh, that. And you see that the type is automatically inferred by Kotlin. If in your IDE you don't see this if and type, because uh, I'm not sure what is the default, but uh, maybe in some version of uh, IDE it's not displayed by default. And that's super useful to have this type uh, inferred displayed ev even if you don't have to write it. Uh, if you don't have that in your IDE, you, you go to settings, you go to editor, uh, you go to general appearance, that's a very long journey. Uh, show parameter name ins, configure, Kotlin, and then you check this, these three ones, uh, parameter and argument name ins. I usually don't, don't check that, but you do what you want. And this will show you the inferred types even if you don't have to write it. Notice that it's optional, so I can totally write uh, mustache.compiler. Okay, that's, uh, that's perfectly fine. But I'm not forced to. Uh, notice the exclamation mark at the end. Uh, that's be because Kotlin interpret that as a platform type. So platform type are a type which nullability is unknown because it's coming, it's, it's coming from a Java API and uh, Kotlin can't know the null, null safety of this element. So when you see this exclamation, exclamation mark, that means that Kotlin don't know if it's nullable or not. I think we are okay with that one. Uh, I'm going to migrate uh, to migrate that one, so I can use the um, conversion facilities. So everything is not perfect, so I'm going to fix that. So I remove that thing. Uh, in Kotlin, instead of arrays dot as lists we usually write list of, okay, but the same, shorter. Here you can see that there is, um, there is an error. Do you know why? Do you see why there is this error? It, it's not super obvious, it's because there is a difference of null safety between, with, between what is declared here and here. Because if I have not the same uh, null safety between, between both, it's interpreted like different types, basically. So I take a nullable string as input and I return a, a non-nullable um, string. Okay. I'm going to remove that one. So this class is okay, but I can make it a little bit more idiomatic. Um, when I say idiomatic, it's to, to make it look like yeah, bet, better Kotlin. Um, if statements in Kotlin are expressions, that means they return a value. Uh, that also applies to try uh, or to other kind of expression. So what I can do is to use my one-liner syntax to write directly that. Okay. If we return, uh, we return a value. So I can write short code like that because uh, in, in, in Kotlin, if we return a value, and that's uh, also super um, uh, nice with try to be able to have try that return something also. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the um, functional support in, in Kotlin. So in Java, to use lambdas, we have to basically use functional interfaces which declare uh, a single uh, a single method, a single non-default method. In Kotlin, I can continue to use that, and there is a good interoperability with Java, and I think that's a very key point. Uh, Kotlin has a, a very, very good interoperability with Java, and, and that's one of the key reasons why we support that in Spring, because 
uh, really uh, Kotlin make it its best to support Java and the JVM ecosystem the best at it, it can. So yeah, really Java interop is fine. But if I want to write that in a more Kotlin-ish way, notice that I, I don't have to use these uh, functional interfaces, which are a kind of wrapper or additional noise. I can directly define pure functions based on their input and their output. So this is the Kotlin equivalent to um, what I write in previously. I'm going to use invoke because that's the default um, default name for such uh, such pure function. So you see, both are equivalent, and um, uh, but that's more more Kotlinish <laughs> to write that like uh, that. Okay. Uh, I think that's one is great. Uh, maybe a, a, a little bit more detail about you, you remember I had to declare the, um, the Kotlin Spring plugin. So Kotlin Spring plugin is um, a specialized version of the Kotlin All Open plugin. Okay, and this will automatically um, so by default in Kotlin every class and method is final. Okay. That's different than in Java where everything is open and we need to put the final keyword to make it uh, final. In, in Kotlin, that's uh, the opposite thing. You have everything final by default. That's a choice that could be discussed. That's maybe the choice I would uh, discuss the most in Kotlin, but uh, that's uh, things are uh, like they are. And, and there is some good reason for that. Um, and I have to put the open keyword to make this class or this method open. Um, and in Spring, in some part of Spring, we need to have open classes and open methods because, for example, here for Java config, we need to extend these classes and this method at runtime uh, to be uh, with CGLib to be able to do, um, yeah, Java config is based on this mechanism, basically. Uh, the same for transactional, for example, when you have transactional uh, methods, you have to spring extend these methods with um, uh, CJLib or with our JDK Demic proxy to, to handle the transactional thing. And with Kotlin, without the plugin, you have to put open keyword on these classes and these methods. Uh, that could be a pain. So uh, we have discussed with the JetBrain guys. And um, what they have done is that with the Kotlin Spring plugin, every method or class is annotated with a Spring annotation or meta annotated with a Spring annotation will be open by default. That means that um, when I say meta annotated, that means that every annotation meta annotated with add component, for example, will be automatically open. That means that in your company, you have some custom annotations uh, annotated with add component, for example, they will be automatically open because we go through the annotation hierarchy and we identify that it's annotated uh, with add component, for example. That's, so that's quite flexible. You can obviously also configure the plugin to uh, do that on um, other kind of annotation, but uh, in practice, that uh, make it uh, work like in Java and you don't have to care. So, now we are going to start the hard stuff and we are going to migrate the util class. So, uh, in Kotlin, that's not super idiomatic to have util uh, classes. In Java, uh, that's a, a usual thing. In Kotlin, we are going to try to use uh, instead... Um, so, you can use that, I mean, this code. If I convert this code to Kotlin, that will work and you will be able to use your... your your util classes. But I'm going to convert to extensions. So extension functions are another key, fe key feature of Kotlin and that allow you to basically add additional methods to existing types. I'm going to show you uh, just now. So I'm going to convert it like that. Instead of utils, I'm going to call it extensions. And I'm going to change everything. So, um, like I said, you don't have to use uh, class wrappers. You can write directly top-level function. 
So before writing some extension function, let's just uh, write top level functions. So that's that. I'm going to use my usual fun keyword, okay, to declare this this method. Uh, here, the type could be here. Uh, for n, that's an int that will translate to an int uh, capitalized in Kotlin. And here you see I have this uh, this if statement. I'm going to use in Kotlin a when expression. And I'm going to translate this code, this Java code, to um, idiomatic Kotlin. So and in, I can use this interval syntax. Okay, uh, another Kotlin feature that is worth to use is string interpolation. So instead of concatenate strings, you usually write directly with the dollar that. And that uh, allows you to write, uh, I mean, the code is more readable. It does not have to generate uh, intermediate strings. So that's more, more efficient. I'm going to, I don't go as fast as Josh Long, so sorry for waiting, but uh, I'm just a human. Okay, I remove the optional semicolon. I'm using string interpolation because it's fun. That, uh, I forget it, the arrow, the arrow, okay. One thing uh, which is nice with when is that I need to check all the various cases. So if I forget a case, which is, which happened here, I need to check everything. So if I do that, okay, when expression must be exhaustive. So I will be exhaustive with an else. With the arrow. And that's it. So I, I have written a top level function in a more Kotlin idiomatic way, so you can see that it's much more readable from uh, than Java. Now, what is an extension function? An extension function is something that, um, so to, to use this function, I use, I will just have to write, for example, uh, get ordinal of two, okay? If I want to transform that to an extension function, I will write that like that. That means that I am adding a get ordinal uh, function to the int type, even if I don't own the int uh, source code. So I have to modify it a, lot, uh, a little bit to write this instead of n. So both are equivalent in terms of uh, bytecode. It's almost the same, but extension function are just um, yeah, syntactic sugar that make your code readable more uh, easily. And that's a pretty nice syntactic sugar, I would say. So we are going to see what, how, how we use that. So we are going to make this code much shorter. So we keep this as private. So when I write private val, that means that this uh, value will be private to the file, okay? I don't have to encapsulate that in a class, but that will be private to the file. Now I'm going to simplify this code because we can, I still using the range uh, syntax in Kotlin. And I'm going to generate from, from this range of integer, I'm going to generate a map with, um, with the days as a key and with the ordinal a string as value. So I'm going to use, so you can see that I have various, uh, uh, various, various method. I can use directly map. Okay, I don't have to write dot stream, dot collect, etc. I just use dot map because that's uh, what I expect. 
Here, I'm going to associate to transform this, uh, this list to a map. And I'm going to use, so here I am the, the value, and then I'm going to create a pair with n dot to long, because I will not, I will need the long type later. And I will just use, oh, uh, two ordinal, that will be better, okay, in terms of naming. And you can see that my uh, two ordinal extension function is available right here on a regular integer um, type. So it looks like nicer. In Kotlin, there is also a default uh, parameter for uh, lambdas. So instead of writing that, I can write it. So it, when you have a lambda that takes a single parameter, you have it, default parameter, and you don't have to write to declare explicitly your lambda parameter. It will be available um, uh, like that. And if I st still want to make that code a little bit more idiomatic, so pair is okay, like an entry, but I can use this syntax. That's that's similar to pair. Okay, that's a that's a, a Kotlin syntax to declare uh, a, a, a pair with that way. So you use the way that you prefer. Obviously, Kotlin is still young, so um, best practice could change from various teams. And best practice is currently an, an ongoing process to be able to define that. But uh, yeah, I think that looks look like um, an idiomatic code. And you see that the type map long string is inferred and display with the option that I have shown at the beginning. Uh, we will do a, a pause after the step one, which is the longest one, okay? Uh, we will do a pause um, when I will have finished that part. So, Okay, maybe I will remove that later. Hmm. Um, let's change that to a private val. So same thing, I don't have to repeat. I mean, in Java, you see that this information or this information are duplicated. So that seems quite logical to just have that guessed. Okay. In Kotlin, you still have constructors, like in Java, you just uh, have to remove the new keyword, okay? That's the same syntax than in Java, but without the new keyword. I remove the optional semicolon. We have this slugify function that looks like a, a nice candidate for our extension methods. So I'm going to declare fun. I'm going to, yeah, uh, so slugify will be an extension of string that will I will be able to write my string dot slugify. Slugify is to transform any kind of uh, string with uh, special characters and spaces to something that fit better in URL with dashes and everything lowercase, etc. I will do the join at the end. Let's remove a lot of code. This. So when I write an extension function, the type I am extending will be available in this, okay? Uh, replace all will be replace, and here I have an extension function on string to transform that to regex with a nice syntax highlighting, and then I will join to string. Okay. And I can see that, as I expected, the return value is a string. Let's modify that as well. So I'm going to write fun temporal accessor dot format to English equals and here I'm using this. Okay, we remove the news imports. And we are now going to use these um, extension functions 
in our code. So here I have a database initializer. Database initializer is um, uh, something that will uh, add some data in my in my um, uh, database MongoDB database at startup. I'm going no, I'm going to translate it with that because otherwise that will be super long. Okay, so now we see that the automatic conversion has done most of the job, and we just need to polish it. So. Uh, in Kotlin, you don't have any checked exception. I can remove that. Uh, and you can see here, instead of writing utils.slugify reactor title, I will write the more nice looking, at least from my test. Okay. And this, we'll just call that. So that's technically, in terms of bytecode, that's just like a, a utils function, but that's your, your code read, read better. Also notice that here I am in the same package, so that works without anything, but um, you need to import uh, extension functions. That means that if you have an extension function in one package and you are using it in, in your code, you have to import that. That's a little bit like the static imports. Uh, that way everything, if you have a library that provides a huge number of extension functions, you will not have your um, autocomplete bloated by a lot of additional properties, you have to uh, import them. And usually ID does a pretty good job to highlight. Uh, I think Mark, you will show that uh, later. Uh, that will highlight that, okay, maybe let's import, let's import that extension function. A little bit like uh, it is done with static imports. Okay, reactor title slugify, spring title slugify. Do the same also here. Okay, um, I could let the code as that, but I prefer to use some more nice looking list stuff. I think here also. List of. Okay, I think we are great. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so now we have converted most of our application and we, are, we have remaining uh, work to do at controller level and for the test. So let's start by the controller level and then we will run the unit test, the integration test. I hope that will work. Um, so HTML controller, yeah, we can, can migrate that one. So I'm a lazy man, so I will use that. Okay. Hmm? Ah, yeah, yeah, true. Um, unlike in other languages, like in Scala, I guess, by default, like I showed in the domain model classes, the properties that you declare with this syntax are public by default, okay? So when you are using that in, um, uh, in the constructor of a bin, Usually, you would you want to specify private because you don't want that uh, accessible from the outside. That just uh, this syntax is uh, an implied auto wired constructor. In Kotlin, we try to favor constructor injection. In, in Java, also, if you are a fan of uh, Oliver Geer, for example, he usually push for that. And generally, in the Spring team, we push for constructor based injection for your regular controller service bins. And in, in Kotlin, that's even more important because of the null safety, because if you, you don't uh, do that, and you will see that later with the tests, you will have to use late init vars or nullable properties or things like that. So really, constructor-based injection is even, even more important in Kotlin. And you could write that, but that will expose post repository as a public uh, property with a getter, and we don't need that, so we just do that, okay? And uh, this will be automatically auto-wired because there is a single constructor. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, uh, we can maybe make this code more nice. Uh, uh, you see, post is an iterable, and in Java to create a stream for an iterable, you have this ceremony. 
So here I'm just going to write map and you just don't need collect. So you can see that even for simple things, uh, Kotlin code is more concise, you remove a lot of noise and you just get a pragmatic code that do what you expect without too much ceremony. Um, Mark will show later, uh, I think, a shorter syntax to, to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, that's okay. So now let's have a look to this post DTO thing. So we are using Mustache. Mustache is originally a, a JavaScript based uh, template engine, and here we are using Gmustache. Uh, I think that's Dave Sire that wrote a nice blog post about that, and I also like very much Mustache for doing simple things. It's less powerful that, than Team Leaf, for example, that's, but that's pretty nice. And it's allowed to write this kind of code, okay, which, which is a logicless template. So basically, you, you only iterate other um, data classes and display this kind of field, but you don't integrate some complex logic in your, uh, in your templates. Uh, in order to achieve clear, clean separation between your templates and your code. So what, what we are going to do here, because you see our post, uh, for example, our, our post domain model object, uh, here we have a local data time, and if we just render it with a mustache, it will display a local data time to string, which will display, we don't really control the format of the date. So what we are going to do is to transform the post uh, object to a post DTO object where we will control how uh, dates are serialized, where we will uh, compile. So, this uh, you see the headline and the content, they are, they are markdown. Um, you see that this is markdown, and to display it, we want to have HTML. So, basically, we are going to transform the markdown to uh, HTML code. Uh, when we are going to transform a post to a post DTO, and what we are going to render here is a post DTO object. Okay. So um, what we are going to do is to transform this this code to um, a Kotlin data class. Okay, but a Kotlin data class contain only data. Okay, we only get data, so we have to to do something because what we want to do is to get a data class. I'm going to move that. I'm going to use the short syntax slug, which is used for the URL title. We don't change anything. Headlines content will contain the HTML version of the Markdown compiled thing. Author will stay the same, and here added at will be a string because we will um, we will format the string uh, before. And here is another nice use case for the extension methods. Let's let's say that uh, this is my domain model, and I don't want to pollute it with uh, things that are related to the front end. Okay, and what I can do here is to add an extension function on posts, which will be called 2DTO, and which will return a post DTO object. So 2DTO will take a markdown converter, and here I'm going to, yeah, there is name parameter in Kotlin, you can show that later. So I initialize it with slug, with title, with uh, headline. So we, for the headline, we need to transform that with the markdown converter, like that, I think. I continue invoke because we change to native Kotlin syntax. The author, and we are going to use our nice 
extension method. So I'm going to write added at dot. So not to English. You see that I have to import the extension method to be able to use it. So I, I write alt enter. It is imported. And, and that's it. So um, that's pretty nice because I don't have to pollute my post domain model class with some front end thing. I just write my DTO uh, class and then I adding it here. That means that in my HTML controller, I will just write post dot to DTO and that's it. DTO. And that's it. Um, crappy import. Okay. Hmm. I don't like red. Okay. Uh, that works. Um, notice that I can also use name parameter in, in Kotlin. So I will maybe show that uh, if you are writing, for example, you can. Okay. You can specify the parameter by names. I will show you that uh, later with uh, the copy method. So I think we are good here. Yeah. We convert. We convert that controller too. So here it's better to, so that works, but I can use, uh, you begin to be used to that. So type in France to be able to use just that. And that works. So here you see that's a method, a find one method that is using an optional um, request param. And Mark is also going to show a better, a new functionality about that, but that will be uh, later. So here I'm going to use equals when when converter and I will use various cases. So if my converter is equals to markdown, I'm going to do post repository dot find all dot uh, let that's a kind of a map operation that will allow me to transform that. And I'm going to write Mm -hmm. um, it that. So here I'm using the copy method, which is pretty interesting because here what I want to do, it's um, I will continue to use, uh, unlike for the, the HTML controller, I will still use my post classes, but I want just to, when the markdown uh, converter is specified, to transform the headline and contents uh, from markdown to HTML. And here is a case where we just want to modify two fields of an immutable data classes. So what is nice with data classes is that we have this copy method automatically generated. And what I'm going to do is that with, um, with name, um, name parameters, I'm going to specify that. I uh, think that's okay. So it is the default lambda parameters, which is the, um, the element returned by find one. And here, uh, copy give me the opportunity to modify just a selected subset of properties. And that's it which is a regular problem when you deal with uh, immutable classes. So here we don't have to do anything. If there is no, um, no converter specified, I just return the one from the repository and else I will throw an exception. Uh, 
Okay. So you see, I'm not using the new keyword because I'm in Kotlin, but it's the same syntax. And that's it. So yeah, that's look nice, uh, look like a bit better code, at least to me. And I will finish by converting that to Kotlin with a lazy option that I will just improve with a more idiomatic code. Okay, we are almost there. Okay. I think I think we are done. Um, so I'm going to run the integration test. Um, okay. Let's pray for some green bar because I have changed a lot of things. Okay, nice. So we have, so we still have our uh, code in Java uh, in test. I'm going to change that, and after that, you will be able to uh, drink a coffee, a tea, or anything else. But you see that when we have a look to our code, the first thing to note is that you can totally write Kotlin code like Java code, and just yeah, you do, you don't have to use all this Kotlin idiomatic thing from the first time. It takes some time to be used to, but you can just begin to convert it and have a kind of better Java. And after that, you begin to use more advanced feature, and you ended up with uh, I think half less code for the same application, something that is easier to debug to read. And uh, you, you, yeah, you can use this kind of nice tricks to have a, a more maintainable uh, application, even if we are using the same framework. I mean, that Spring Boot one, it contains no support for Kotlin, and we just take advantage of the language. So now let's quickly migrate the tests. So still you see automatic conversion thing. So here notice that uh, we are using the colon colon notation to get the class, okay? Uh, that remains the same. Uh, I will keep my abstract integration test. So here, here is an example where we are going to do a field injection. Uh, maybe with GUnit5 we may be able to inject some value directly to the functions, but I'm not sure it works. So uh, today we are going to, to keep using this kind of thing. And here I'm going to use late init var. Uh, why? Uh, the issue here is that uh, Kotlin deal with null safety natively. And when a, when a class is initialized, but not yet injected with, via the field, Basically, uh, you need to define the value, and it's if you don't use, if you just want to use that property, must be initialized. Okay, uh, Kotlin has no knowledge that we are going to inject something later with Spring, so you ended up by uh, doing um, that, and that's bad because you have null null label uh, fields everywhere and when you use them you have to write uh, exclamation mark exclamation mark and that's a pain so in order to avoid that um, the kotlin guys have added um late init var that allow us to basically provide a non null label field that will be injected later and kotlin will throw a null pointer exception if uh, uh, if it is not or non, maybe not a null pointer exception, but a not initialized exception or something like that. So here that's in test, so we, we will say that's okay, and we will use this late init var. Late init var, and here. So exclamation mark, exclamation mark is when you are using uh, something that is a uh, uh, new label to be able to to use it without any additional checks. Uh, we are going to use that, or we have various operators to deal with null safety. Here, since we are using non nullable thing, that's okay. We are going to take advantage of the string interpolation. So 
If I am in this case, I don't have to put the curly braces. I just write dollar port, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to migrate these tests. Okay. So again, Mark will show later how we can get a better, a better syntax than that. Here we are using uh, no Kotlin support and we provide uh, something to improve that. Uh, I think this one is, is just okay. We are going to convert that. Okay, so this one is, yeah. I guess Mark, you will also talk about that later. So you, we will have better code here. Uh, let me fix that. And also that. Okay. And also the last one. Okay, so we are going to try to run them again. Okay, nice. Um, something that I would like to show you also, let me... Uh, uh, No, let's do it directly here. Um, you can write expressive test names with backticks. So backticks allow you to use any uh, Unicode character into your function names. In your regular production code, I would not advise to use a fancy name with strange characters, even if you are free to do that. But in tests, uh, that's pretty nice because if you are used to specification like uh, test framework, uh, you can write this kind of sentence, okay? Just plain sentence in order to avoid the um, not so much readable camel case notation. Okay, and when you run this test, you will have a regular sentence printed here and in your test report and things like that. So um, I think that's a pretty nice feature to be able to write more expressive test names. And in my Kotlin application, I use backticks everywhere in, um, in the function names in tests to be able to um, yeah, have this kind of expressive name. Uh, I think we are mostly done, so we can maybe just have a look that our application is is running as, as expected, even if we have migrated everything. Okay. So yeah, nothing super fancy, but my application is working and I have modified a lot of things and that's okay. Um, maybe uh, if some of you have questions, I could uh, answer them uh, if you have any. Does uh, somebody ask, have a question about that part, which was mainly about converting Java to Kotlin without taking advantage about specific uh, feature? Yeah. So performances, yeah. Um, so uh, Kotlin uh, is, as you know, may maybe is super um, popular in, in Android world. And in fact, it's, it all started, uh, the success started mostly on the Android side at the beginning. So Kotlin is really designed to provide super efficient uh, bytecode. So un unlike uh, other languages that produce a very different bytecode, the bytecode produced is very close to the Java one. Even when you use uh, some fancy feature like extension functions, the, the bytecode is uh, almost the same. So some people, uh, I think somebody wrote a blog post about the the cost of Kotlin, for example, which detail 
what is the cost in terms of performances, in terms of bytecode, uh, when you generate such application with Kotlin. And that's barely the same uh, on Android, which is super, uh, yeah, when you, you really need to have the, uh, the same level of performance. So in, in, in server side, I would say that's, um, yeah, that's barely the same. There is some tools uh, to be able to check that. So you can, uh, you, you can take any Kotlin code, okay? You go to tools, Kotlin, show Kotlin by code, uh, decompile because I'm just a human. Oh, and I have a nice error. <laughs> okay, so uh, in, in regular world outside, uh, uh, when the demo gods are here, uh, it, shows, um, it, sh it shows the Java byte code, and you will see that that's on mainly the same than, um, let's try another thing. Okay, so here that works. Um, and you can see that from this um, uh, fr from this uh, Kotlin code, so the first thing is that Kotlin is adding some metadata because, as you have seen, Kotlin is dealing with other uh, notions that are not uh, supported on Java. So, for example, null safety information um, and other things. So it adds metadata like that. Uh, there is this is where we leverage the Kotlin reflection to be able to get this information without parsing this super low level stuff. But uh, except that, okay, you see that my non nullable fields translate to regular uh, Java methods and fields annotated with at not null. So I mean the, the translation it's it's not like dynamic languages that generate super different bytecode. It's almost the same, and and really. Yeah, they, they did a pretty good job too. You see my my copy, yeah, there is some components methods that are generated. You remember my copy method that I'm using to just specify a few ones, I'm using that. So yeah, that's, I mean, even the, the, the Java code generated from the bytecode is super readable. And yeah, the, the performance impact is almost uh, a, a nil. Oh, I have forgotten to remove all this crappy semicolon. So, uh, researching path, KT. Um, accept command and string intervals. Okay. So I don't, so maybe, yeah, you, you quickly get used to, to not have semicolons anymore. Uh, the, the, the goal is mainly to have uh, yeah, less, less, less noise and distraction when you read code. Another question? Yeah? Generate the Kotlin code from the byte code? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, what is done usually is just to generate that from the Java code, which contain more information. Uh, and you, we usually do, I mean, you can generate Java code from bytecode, so you can do bytecode to Java and Java to Kotlin, but that's, if you have the source code, that's better to, to, to generate that from the Java source code, which contain more information. N no? <laughs> you seem not super convinced. Okay, uh, we can maybe discuss uh, just after the talk or during the um, uh, the post to to go deeper in that. Yeah. Uh, what is exactly the question? Okay. Um, yeah, difference between uh, Groovy and Kotlin. Uh, it's it's true that the syntax looks uh, could could look like barely the same. Um, in fact, uh, Kotlin uh, has taken a lot of inspiration from Groovy, but also from other uh, languages. I mean, JetBrains is a company that built uh, initially uh, a lot of development tools, and they know very well each language because they have to build an IDE for .NET for Scala, uh, for Java, for other languages. And when we discussed with, with them, a, a lot of inspiration is their experience of the various languages. And they have tried to, to create a mix of various features 
uh, also to, to not integrate a lot of other features because uh, a language is the feature that you support, but also the, the one that you don't support. And so clearly Kotlin get a lot of inspiration of uh, uh, Groovy uh, for some syntax, but in fact, they are, they are super different. When, when you develop with both, uh, even if Groovy supports that uh, static compilation with the add compile static annotation, uh, Groovy from its root is a dynamic language. It's a dynamic language and all the ecosystem is mainly leveraging this dynamic uh, um, nature. And when you see the bytecode generated, for example, it's it's quite different. Uh, the level of, I mean, Kotlin is more statically typed than Java because of the null safety thing. Uh, but except this uh, topic, it's really the same. You have the, exactly the same level of type in France, where in Groovy, even if the, the work on compile static uh, is has been super great and a great addition to the language, basically static Groovy and regular Groovy are two different languages and the development experience is super different. So really, yeah, the, the, the static nature of Kotlin uh, in practice, when you developed uh, with it and with all the ecosystem, uh, make a, a huge difference uh, in terms of the um, how you feel. That's that's really a statically taped language from the root. Uh, so that's quite different in practice. Okay, so maybe let's uh, let's do a, a, a pause. Uh, I don't know when we will start, but uh, yeah, maybe. In, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, let's take the time and we will continue with step two, step three and step four, which will be shorter, but that will show you all the various features that we support in Spring Boot 2 to leverage uh, a Kotlin various feature. Thanks. Okay. Oh, we're on. Excellent. Uh, the, uh, the second part of this is a bit shorter. It's also a bit more exciting. Uh, when we got here, we, uh, we had to make a few adjustments. Uh, I, we, our original intention is uh, Sebastian was going to present with his uh, Linux machine and I was going to present with my Mac. Uh, and um, I think uh, Sebastian and my colleague Josh have been talking because uh, Josh and I trade off uh, presenting and making each other uncomfortable with uh, alternating or dueling laptops. Uh, well, the Mac didn't cooperate this morning, so now I'm going to be uh, using the uh, Linux laptop. And just to complicate things even further, because it wasn't complicated enough, uh, this is, is not the American keyboard. Uh, so <laughs> I, uh, I'm a touch typist, uh, so this is, uh, this is going to be a bit challenging. I will uh, appreciate any good thoughts you send my way to make sure my fingers find at least close to the right keys. And if it really gets bad, I'll pull Sebastian in to, to rescue me uh, at some point. But uh, this, this could be fun, right? Uh, <laughs> demo gods are, are not being kind this morning, but uh, hopefully this will uh, all work out and we won't uh, wind up blowing this up and smoking it. So anyway, uh, so where, where do we go from here? Uh, Sebastian did an excellent job kind of laying the, the groundwork uh, in terms of we have a starting Java project. We're going to convert it to Kotlin with uh, boot 1.0 still. Uh, now we're going, the next step is, is to kind of take that into uh, Spring Boot 2.0 and to make some uh, minor changes and adjustments as that uh, implies. Uh, so let's start, I'd like to start with just looking at the uh, build file here. Uh, let's see, there we go. Uh, so, so the build file, as you can see here, we're still running with uh, boot version 157 release. Uh, there are a few other things that will change as we go through. Uh, the Kotlin Noarg plugin becomes uh, not required because with boot 2.0, uh, it supports Spring Data K, K-A-Y, which uh, with Spring Data, it's alphabetical releases, and Spring Data K was the first uh, version, which uh, brings in um, uh, some of the, the niceties. It, it uh, allows you to uh, fully, fully supports um, immutable classes in Kotlin. Uh, you no longer have to have a noarg plugin and uh, accommodate that that way. Uh, it also, with boot 2.0 supports, um, uh, will, we'll, uh, how do I want to say this? Let's see, um, 
We no longer have to bring in or, or specify the uh, Jackson data type JSR310 uh, and the uh, other Jackson module for Kotlin uh, to get the uh, Java 8 data types uh, because we're, we're baselining for Spring Boot 2.0, Spring Fi Framework 5.0 on Java 8. Uh, so let me go back here and uh, yay, <laughs> keys, uh, I'm actually hitting the right keys. This is a, off to a good start. Uh, so let's do a checkout of 2A. Uh, yes, 2A. Ah, that's a good idea. Yep. Where's the dash dash? Oh, thank you. <laughs> and there, the A is up. Got it. Okay, so now we're good. Uh, so, shift. Uh, yay. It's, it feels so tentative. It's like I'm just learning to type all over again, <laughs> which is going to be really fun when I go back uh, you know, later on, but uh, ah, it is what it is. Uh, so anyway, um, so let's, let's go back and take a look at the uh, build file again, just to zoom in a little bit. Uh, oops, let's see. I need to refresh here. Um, where's my... How do I get to my Gradle window here? So I can refresh. What do you want to do? I uh, just want to refresh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Uh, we're still not. Uh, we're still not refreshed. What happened here? Um, let me check. Two A. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, maybe you, uh, I did a mistake in the intermediate branch, so maybe let's. No, that's okay. We have the oh, okay. Spring Boot so 2, and yeah, that should be fine. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, so um, let's, yeah, we're in good shape. So the first thing you notice probably at the top, if I can get back to the top, the scroll is even backward. Uh, re I shouldn't say backward. My scroll is backward or his, depending on perspective. Uh, but, uh, so it is quite an exciting time. The Spring Boot version is at 2.0.0 uh, build snapshot. Uh, and as you can see, the NOARG um, dependencies are gone and specifications here. We're also adding the, uh, the JSR305 strict uh, flag so that we can uh, do null safety. Uh, if we go in here and we'll uh, check out, uh, I'll show you this. Scroll, scroll. Yeah, while you go to the, to the dependency, go. so we have added uh, a null safety annotation in the whole uh, Spring framework code base and also in Spring Data K to be able to provide with the uh, free compiler arg option that uh, Stefan, uh, Mark has shown, um, null safety from a Kotlin point of view. Right, so this allows us to, uh, at the package level, define uh, that it is a non-null API and then override at the parameter and the field and the return type level uh, when return types are, uh, or when those values are nullable uh, specifically. So it, it tightens everything up and, and gives you that null uh, safety at, uh, throughout uh, all of the spring functionality. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, I guess let's start. Could maybe show the, um, can you go to the null, uh, non -null oh, sure. API? to show that itself is control with... Um, there we go. Yeah, so you can see that the non-null API, which is a spring annotation, is meta-annotated with GSR305 uh, uh, meta-annotations, which allow uh, tooling to take that in account in a generic way. So the tooling has not... Uh, the tooling that support that, mainly currently ID and Kotlin, and I hope Sonar and other things will catch up. Uh, the idea is that they don't have to uh, provide any specific spring support for that. They just have to leverage via reflection or, or other uh, ways this annotation, even when they are not in the class pass with the runtime retention that works. And that allows uh, this tooling to, to 
yeah, to, to, to understand the null safety semantics uh, without any specific support for Spring. Okay, so let's see if I can... Uh, nope. There we go. Okay, so, um, yes. Uh, let's start uh, by something Sebastian had kind of hinted at earlier. Uh, we're going to make this a bit more idiomatic. I'm going to make a very f a few small code changes uh, to accommodate uh, some of the features that we've added in for Spring Boot 2.0, as well as the, the newer niceties uh, with the Kotlin module. So uh, for starters, uh, this is a very uh, you know, Java look. Obviously, we're doing a Spring application run. We're, we're passing in the application class, the Java class, uh, so we can actually make this a bit more idiomatic with our uh, <laughs> run application. Application always helps to hit the right keys. And then um, application. And then this allows us to take this uh, down to here. And actually, we could do one other thing since we're in the neighborhood, right? If I can get the keys down. Um, ah. Yeah, uh, that's uh, and Angie. which yeah, with that one. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> French French keyboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was so easy yeah. earlier. So, so, uh, French, so French. Okay. So uh, what we what we can do <laughs> is uh, what we may not be able to do is uh, go ahead and provide the lambda for our um, uh, method here. So I'm just going to uh, uh, set the banner mode, uh, assuming I can keep my fingers on the right keys. And let's see, even the period. Yes, okay. All right. Uh, and yeah, this is going to be painful. So uh, <coughs> anyway, that's, it's a very, <laughs> very long way to demonstrate a very short thing. Uh, so this just makes uh, your your way of kicking off your application a little more idiomatic uh, Kotlin versus the, the way that we were doing it before. Uh, certainly interchangeable, it's just a little bit more familiar in terms of um, formatting. Uh, let's see, some other things that we wanted to cover. Uh, so if we do a look for, um, uh, that will work. Okay, so this is one thing that's, that's kind of nice. Again, this is certainly not anything that you're required to do, but it's, it's uh, kind of nice that you can. Uh, as you can see here um, in, our, um, uh, in our method here that we're actually a, a pulling in a request parameter or accepting a request parameter, and we've got it annotated as, as required equals false. But as you can see here that we've actually specified a uh, nullable type in Kotlin. Uh, so this allows us to uh, just remove this entirely. And uh, everything still continues to work as we would expect it to. Uh, let's see, is there anything else here that I really want to show? Um, maybe we could add that. Uh, that's also supported for auto wired. So when we are injecting, like here, we are injecting post repository or thing like that, we can also, if you have post repository question mark, that means that's a new label. Uh, uh, a nullable property, and if there is no bin available, uh, basically um, Spring will interpret that as auto wired required equal false, uh, which is also available in inject. So, uh, null safety is also taken in account to infer if a bin is mandatory or optional on a pair parameter or field basis. Okay, so let me. Uh, let's go and check this out. This is a kind of a nice little extra feature as well. Uh, the things that we have to do uh, in, um, uh, in Java because of type erasure. Uh, so if you can see here, we, there we go, uh, that we, we do a little bit of gymnastics here so we can hang on to our uh, types with parameterized type reference. Uh, so we have to use a, and I really wish I knew the, uh, key combination, but um, we have to, um, Control-C, yes? Control-C, yeah. Okay. 
you know what, I may be able to uh, do this and speed this up just a little bit. So instead of having to use a, a REST template exchange method, we can use the much shorter syntax for uh, get for object, right? Uh, except you have to hit the enter key. There we go. And I'm able to provide... Yeah, yeah. Ah, thank you. <laughs> And the same with shift for closing. And same thing. Okay, brilliant. Oh, it's already closed. Excuse me. Um, nope, actually. I know. Okay. There, there we go. Okay. Which allows us to do uh, a lot of really nice things here because then we can clean a lot of this up just by default. Yes. Okay. So. So that makes that a lot more readable. I'm going to go ahead and look for the other exchange and do the same thing here. Uh, let's see. And that's list of user. Okay. And once again, we'll pull this out and replace, whoops, replace with get for. And and that improves that dramatically. There we go. Okay. Yeah. And you need to import so with Alt Enter. You like I was saying, you nice. need to import the. Um, the well maybe let's click on it. Yeah, Alt Enter should do the trick. Import. There yeah. we go. And Brilliant. the previous one, I think it needs to be imported also. So, like I, I was saying, uh, you need to import extension to be able to use them. Uh, and ID will do a pretty good job to uh, propose. Uh, uh There we go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Um, one thing that uh, we could point out, if I can find the M, there we go. Okay. So we have a little bit nicer syntax uh, for accessing our model attributes. Instead of doing a model.add attribute, uh, which is Java uh, syntactically. Uh, the, the idiom uh, that you would employ, uh, we're able to access model as more of an array type of access, which is kind of nice. Uh, again, not anything that's a uh, have to switch over, but it's kind of nice to be able to do that. Um, let's see. So the other thing is uh, so if we take a look at our abstract integration tests class, um, let's see. So we do have a before all, which is a nice, nice bit of uh, JUnit 5 creeping in here that allows us to uh, provide a setup method or a setup function that uh, can execute before each test, or ever, I should say before all tests uh, in this case, so it doesn't have to run before each. JUnit, um, actually, you know what? I need to do that. Uh, and the fact that we have this set up to default to per class means that that's run once for each or for all of the tests in that class versus re executing for each one, which is kind of nice. Um, let's see, what else? I guess that's pretty much it. Same yeah. thing with add after all. Um, because uh, GUnit 4 only supports a static. Uh, in GUnit 4, it's uh, add before class and add after class. And in Kotlin, it translates to companion object, which is not super nice looking. So with GUnix supporting this new uh, per class uh, lifecycle, which instantiates a class, uh, a single time the class when you run multiple tests, because by default GUnit instantiates the class for each test, uh, it it's allows to, like in TestNG, to use non-static um, uh, before class or before all and after class or after all methods, and that's a better <laughs> fit with with Kotlin, uh, not requiring any static. Uh, method for, for, for that. And one thing that I do want to show before we uh, kind of launch into the next phase, because so far we're still in the imperative model. Uh, so it's 
uh, with Spring, uh, Framework 5, Spring Boot 2, it's a very gentle transition to go to a reactive model. Uh, so if you, for instance, as, as Sebastian had, had created earlier, the repositories that we use uh, for the user repository and the post repository, uh, they actually extend the CRUD repository, which is defined in Spring Data. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's as you might expect it uh, to be. It, it returns actual types, you know, so um, uh, you uh, return type T, interval of T, and what have you. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. It's something you're probably very well ac acquainted with if you're used to Spring MVC. Uh, I'm actually going to um, check out the next. Uh, let's see. Oops. See, so Maybe reset again. Yep. Reset. Reset. Where's the dash again? Up here? Nope. It's underscore. Uh, here six. it is, six. <laughs> All right. Oh. You don't have... Um, so step three, we can... Go uh, sorry, uh, that's... With, uh, that one. Just a moment, I did the... Uh, I did an actual get. Get, not get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so does anybody remember the time that they actually learned to type for the first time? That's not a fun, uh, fun revisiting, but it is certainly entertaining. So let's see, get, uh, check out, uh, step, what was it, three? Three, eh? three, yeah, with the shift. Three. Yeah. Alpha? I believe so. Nope, no, step three. Just step three, Just step okay. Three. Boom. All right, so... Uh, one thing that we do want to go back to so now. Just click on the, yeah, click here to get it. Take it in account. Uh, took, uh, All right. And yeah, go to the. So yeah. Yeah, oh, wrong key combination. Ah, let's see. So. Did I do that? Let's see. Yeah, the post repository or the... Oh dear. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah. Okay, active, that will work. Active code repository. Okay. So, as you can see, we're actually uh, extending the reactive CRUD repository now, uh, since we're going with Spring Web Flux instead of Spring MVC. Uh, not a lot different. Uh, you've got the same, uh, same general uh, things happening, at least at the higher level. Uh, when we go in and take a look at it, though, you can see that uh, Spring Data is providing a lot of the heavy lifting for you. A lot of the operations, in fact, the operations are, are the same or similar. The thing that is, really stands out is the return types. Uh, the return types are publishers. Uh, reactive streams publishers. Uh, so you'll see things like a flux of S or a mono of S. Uh, so it, uh, it kind of handles all these things largely behind the scenes in terms of the, the interface. The API is very much the same as what you're already used to dealing with. Uh, it just gives you the uh, reactive capabilities throughout. Maybe I can present a little bit with a few slides um, the reactive stack. Oh, sure. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's fine. So. Um, give give my uh, my my ten thumbs a chance to rest here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to present you a little, a little bit of context, uh, Spring Framework Five comes with two web stack, Spring MVC and Spring Web Flux. So Spring MVC is what you already uh, uh, know, I guess, from Spring Boot and regular Spring application. It's a blocking web framework, and blocking is not a bad word. I mean, uh, it's perfectly fine for for a wide range of use cases. It's based on servlets, on the servlet API. And in Spring Framework 5, we added Spring Web Flux, which is a non-blocking uh, web framework based on reactive streams. The use cases are uh, improving the scalability. So uh, regular um, web framework like Spring MVC use one thread for each request response processing. And with the new one, we are using non-blocking processing. That means we can deal with more uh, request in parallel, so it improves the scalability. It's more suitable for streams, like when you do server sent events, uh, you are dealing with streaming API like Twitter or you, some streaming API that you have in your company. And it's also more suitable for latency when you are building some microservices thing or even just, 
I mean, for a very long time, we, we request remote REST web services. Some of them are not in our company. They are sometimes slow, uh, Im imply some latency. So that allows basically to continue to scale even if you, are, you have some latency in your request processing. And so in addition to this Spring MVC stack based on servlet API, leveraging servlet containers, uh, and using the um, regular annotation-based programming model, this Spring WebFlux new stack uh, make it possible to use non-servlet-based uh, runtimes, for example, servlet 3.1, dot, so servlet dot but that just you see lower in the stack, and it can directly run uh, with uh, embedded native or undertow engines, and I guess new ones will will come later. So reactive streams is a kind of um, specification for asynchronous uh, and non-blocking data exchange between a publisher and a subscriber. We have worked on that with other companies like uh, Latben, Netflix, and others. And that basically introduced an interesting mechanism, which is back pressure. So when there is a publisher and a subscriber, the subscriber subscribe to a publisher, and then no data is sent by the publisher, uh, the subscriber has to request some data, so it sends a request of one, two, three more elements, and then the publisher will send this element. So that's a kind of fine uh, a tuning of the amount of in-flight data that is between a publisher and a subscriber, and that's allowed to, for example, imagine that you have a very fast publisher and a very slow subscriber. Without back pressure, the subscriber will, will be overwhelmed by too much data, and basically it can uh, crash or go out of memory. Here, instead of putting a lot of, uh, dat a lot of uh, data in a buffer and things like that, uh, basically the subscriber and the publisher will um, go to the same speed and that's, that's this kind of mechanism. Um, the exchange between the publisher and the subscriber can be uh, uh, an infinite stream that never completes or a, a finite stream, which is a kind of asynchronous collections, uh, and, and by an error, which is like exceptions, or a complete signal. Uh, the difference also is that you can begin processing the first element that you receive, uh, uh, while with the regular list, you need to wait all the elements before beginning processing it, so that's a, that's a key difference. So WebFlux is internally based on reactive streams, and on Reactor, because we use that uh, reactive implementation, reactive API implementation internally. But you can use every uh, reactive API or asynchronous API that you, we support. We include support for completable future, uh, Flow Publisher, which is reactive streams integrated in Java 9, Eric Java 1, Eric Java 2, Reactor, and any other reactive stream based API like Aka Streams or what you, what you want. Uh, so, Rector contains two main uh, reactive types, Flux and Mono. Flux is, for, uh, is a reactive stream publisher for 0 to n elements. That's similar to Flowable in Eric Java 2 world. Or Observable, if you, you uh, observable with back pressure, I would say, if you know Eric Java 1. It provides uh, different operators, and when you, you develop with such API, you are using a functional style of programming, not imperative. And Mono is a publisher for zero to one element. And uh, so that's a kind of reactive uh, promise, reactive future. So we can switch back to the, um, to the code. Yeah. All right. So let's see. Anything that we else that we want to do? Um, probably want to point out the... Uh, uh, web client, uh, because in a um, uh, if if anyone's coming from a Spring MVC world, they're probably used to the workhorse known as REST template uh, for issuing requests, getting responses, you know, dealing with that, uh, which is very good uh, in a um, uh, blocking fashion. But uh, it certainly doesn't lend itself well to a uh, non-blocking um, API. So uh, we've created a uh, reactive web client. Uh, we see that's actually here. We're setting that up to use in our various tests. And uh, so uh, just as an example here, this uh, actually gives us a, a chance to showcase a couple of things. It's a very fluent API. So you uh, typically will do a get, uh, specify a URI if you need to, if you don't already have a base URI you're referencing, uh, retrieve that. And this allows us to show this. 
uh, because you can convert the body that you're receiving back to a publisher, so a flux, body to flux or body to mono by specifying the type here. And then again, as you see on down through, very fluent, uh, that we can go ahead and, and issue um, additional operations against that uh, stream coming through. So let's see, anything, we probably should just go ahead and kick this off, right? Um, okay, so. And, oh, wrong way, there we go. And obviously I'm not hitting the right keystroke. Uh, you want to run it? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, matter of fact, that you, you need to be right. And so. Yeah, it's, it's just command or control R on Mac. I don't know. You'd think they'd standardize this stuff at some point, but it is what it is. Okay, so um, probably what we should do now is go back here, and that's probably just the safest thing to do here is refresh. So we have uh, current um, current site being shown, and let's go and let's do a post uh, because this gives us a chance to uh, show off some of the uh, server sent events uh, capabilities. Uh, because when you need to uh, publish, uh, you need to publish a stream of values uh, across uh, to a, a web client. Uh, the the easiest well. You have different options uh, with React uh, Project Reactor. You can leverage uh, server sent events. You can leverage WebSocket. Obviously, server sent events lends itself extremely well to this uh, because you're pushing values. So just a, a potentially a small set of values or an infinite stream of values uh, over an indeterminate amount of time. In this case, we're actually using this to feed notifications back out to our client. Uh, so when we do a post, for instance, we should get a nice notification here. So that's kind of nice that we can use that integration from uh, back to front and uh, have a publisher that uh, is just passed along that way. So uh, thank you for your indulgence uh, in terms of the, the coding and the awkwardness with the uh, keyboard. Uh, Sebastian and I were actually talking about, uh, you know, where to or how to proceed with the next step. I think just because I want to make sure you all are out of here by 3.30 this afternoon, I'm going to let him code the next uh, next section so that we can Go ahead and uh, make that happen in a more expedient manner. But thanks, Mark. <laughs> Tag. Um, yeah. So maybe just to sh show you, it, it was so. What we have seen is leveraging uh, a feature that is in in, in Spring Data Reactive, which is ex exposing the tailable cursor. So tailable cursor is a feature from MongoDB when you can get an infinite stream from a collection of documents. And then, when there is a new document in the in the in the collection, basically it will send uh, um, the event fr via a flux, so a flux of post events, and we just transform it to uh, um, server sent events here. So we natively expose that as a flux here, and uh, and that's uh, that works. Uh, so let's go to the step. Uh, I will reset. Step four. A. Refresh. And presenter mode. Okay. So. So here we are going to talk about. Um, an alternative way to uh, specify your uh, your front end. So you own now the regular ad controller, ad request mapping programming model from Spring MVC, and uh, Webflux support that. So you can continue to use the same annotation-based programming model using reactive types. So uh, that will be uh, controllers like we have seen previously, but using uh, um, Flux and Mono or observable, flowable from Eric Java. Uh, this kind of thing, but you can also use a more um, a functional API uh, with Webflux. So, in addition to the uh, annotation-based uh, programming model, we add the support for a functional-based API, which is composed by a router and handlers. So, handlers basically are just functions that take um, uh, as input it takes a server request, 
and the uh, answer, the response is a mono server response, so a kind of future of server response. And here you see there is no add request mapping annotation, so we just specify the handling logic, but without any mapping uh, thing. The, the defining the mapping will be done here in a, in a router, so you can add one, two, three more router. In this example, simple one, I, I will just use one. This uh, API is available in Java, and uh, we have introduced a Kotlin DSL to make it uh, more um, readable. So let's start by a simple thing. I will add a foo root, okay? So uh, a foo root that will, so let's import it, uh, server response.ok, and I will just print AirDevox, okay? So, uh, tuk, 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 tuk. let's run it. Okay. Okay. So here, what I what I did. So this foo is in fact a shortcut for a request predicates. So this routing API is composed. You, you specify your request predicates. Okay, that takes the server request as input and return a boolean true or false to know if if that match. And then here. I'm, I'm not using the, the handler for now. I'm just writing the handler in line directly here. Okay, so this is a shortcut. So internally, if you are curious, that just uh, using um, I'm overloading the invoke operator on string to do this kind of trick, and you can see that I'm just using internally a, a path predicate. Uh, there is various various predicates. You have the predicate all that already returned true. You have the meta the request predicate path, uh, other path predicate headers content type, accept. So you can you can you have various predicates, and you can uh, compose them. That means that uh, I can write, for example. Media type. So here I'm using the regular uh, media type API from Spring. We are we are just reusing our usual stuff. I import it. Um, accept is the request predicates that I have shown previously. And this end thing is an infix function. What is an infix function? So you can see infix. It's in fact exactly the same than that. But infix allow me to specify, to invoke this function without parentheses in order to provide a more functional and readable um, syntax. So really, this is exactly the same. This is not. Kotlin keyword, that's something that I have added. We have added um, support for OR and for NOT. So with that, you can compose with various request predicates to add a custom logic that will um, provide a route based on the path, on the accept, uh, um, on the headers, any kind of logic like that. So uh, here, that should be maybe hand. Okay. And uh, I can, so I can write directly my roots and my under. So uh, let me show you something. Uh, tuk tuk tuk. Okay, I can also obviously use other roots. So I can specify, for example, the um, the method. So I can use bar. So I can do that kind of thing, okay? Uh, that works for simple um, use case, but usually for real application, 
I, I tend to separate uh, my router from my handler. And you see here, I'm injecting references. I'm injecting my uh, HTML handler, user handler, and post handler bin. So if I want to call them, I will do that. Uh, chuk, chuk, chuk. So if I want to build the same application that I had previously, I will just uh, let's let's start from that. So I will call get. Okay, that's a get method with a slash, and then we want to call. Um, I think that's post handler, and here I'm using a method reference to say okay. Um, let's call my post handler find all handler. And here, in my handler, what I'm doing, um, no, that's I need to use the HTML handler, that's for the web service. That's not the right one. Okay, and then should be better. So here, and I'm going to the HTML handler, and then you see that I'm using the functional API uh, to render this page. So this is the equivalent of the view support from Spring MVC, but provided in a more functional way. Here I'm using the syntax I have shown previously to provide the model attributes uh, as a map. And uh, you can see that I'm also here, I'm specifying the, I'm rendering the post thing. So I'm using that, uh, get So here, um, I think I'm using the slug, HTML handler. Post, in my post implementation, you see that I'm using requests.path vari variable with the slug parameter. That's why here I'm providing the slug parameter here. Okay, so let's, let's test it if that works. Oh, amazing. Um, if I go there, I'm using my second uh, handler. OK. Um, but our REST web services are not here yet. For example, if I write post nothing. So let's, let's add that. So the <laughs> another nice feature of the functional router is that it supports uh, nested routes. That means if I want to uh, make that only for hmm. HTML, I will write that dot nest. And then every um, request predicate specified here will apply to here. Okay? So let's use that for doing the same for our JSON web services. Okay, application JSON. Then this time, this is the right time to use my um, post and user handler. So, for example, I will write get slash post, and I will call my post handler dot uh, final with a method reference. Okay. Uh, I, I, if you want to write that without a method reference, you write uh, chuk, 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 chuk. Excuse me. Chuk, chuk. Okay, you you write that, and that will be the same. Okay, if uh, you want more detail, I can specify explicitly that that's a rec parameter. That's my lambda parameter. Okay, that's the same. Since we can use the, the default parameter, I can do the short version, which is that. So here, in this lambda, the parameter I, I get is the request, the server request. And since I think that's a better syntax to use method reference, it's just the equivalent of that. Okay, uh, let's add our so this should be the slug, I think, again. <coughs> Here I'm using find one, 
I can check. Find one is the handler. OK, it seems I'm using slug, so it should work. You see that here I'm using both post and post. So maybe we could continue to use this uh, fancy uh, nested roots thing to write post. OK. Dot nest. Then I put that inside. Then I remove. Basically, I put everything in common there. And that should work. Uh, I can do the same for my users. So user. Here I'm using my user handler. Same here. So this is not a slug. This is a maybe a login. Let's check. OK, a login. Find all user should be good. Okay, so the um, I think uh, we are going to check that that works obviously, because okay, amazing. If I take the slug, I can check that it works. You can check the users. That's work. And if I going to see a user, that work. So I think the interesting thing is that with that syntax, uh, it's maybe more readable. Uh, for Kotlin developers, that's, that seems to be, from the feedback I had, a more idiomatic way to, to develop web application rather than putting uh, annotations everywhere. You have the choice, so I have really no recommendation for that. You can use the annotation-based programming model because you are used to annotation from Swing MVC or you are just fine with that. You can use that um, new feature that allow you to have a slightly different API um, that allow to basically have all your roots in one place. Uh, you can also split it. The difference is that with annotations, you are forced to split all your mapping uh, in all your add controller request mapping classes, where here I have the possibility if I want to put all my roots in a centralized routing thing that is also compiled. It's a bit, yeah, a kind of declarative API. And um, I have the choice to put everything in the router, split the router and the handlers like I did in this example. And um, yeah, uh, I can also obviously specify. So this is a post request. OK, and if I want to do save. And here, and this model is is so you you, you don't provide any uh, fancy uh, method parameter like with Spring MVC. So that's maybe more um, yeah different ways to specify that, and that's up to you. Uh, um, chuk chuk What can I show? You can also delete. Okay, delete specifying the slug and providing post handler that did it. Uh, if I go back to, if I get the full version because, so, hard, uh, check out step four. Okay, so in this version, you, you see that I have also added the server sent event thing. So get slash API slash post slash notifications. I add I add a condition request predicates about the text event stream, and then I, I invoke the the notification. So this one is. Um, And here I'm using just OK dot body to server strand events, and that's uh, that's all. You can see that here we are leveraging also mm. we are leveraging Kotlin extensions. So if I go to the detail, so this is Kotlin extensions, and and maybe something interesting to show. Um, let me show you that. Uh, if I go to the source code, that. Uh, 
OK. You can see that this server request extensions, which is specific to Kotlin, is directly provided in the Spring framework jars. So we, we don't uh, add Kotlin support with an additional uh, Spring Kotlin uh, jar. It's directly provided in the regular Spring uh, framework dependencies. If you are doing a Java project, it's just not used. But if you are doing a Kotlin project, uh, this extension will be available by default in your class pass, and you will be able to import, uh, imp import them. If I'm back to the source code, you can see that's like the, the extensions I built in my previous example, but here provided to provide the Kotlin uh, API, Kotlin specific API in addition to the regular Java one. So when you are using Spring f in a Kotlin project, you have all the regular Java regular API, and most of the Java API is the same that you use for Kotlin, but we also provide additional stuff that allow us, for example, here, to leverage the, uh, the reified type parameters, that's a horrible expression, to say that Kotlin is avail I I it's in Kotlin it's possible via inline function to retrieve the generic types at, at runtime and then uh, get, the, um, get the class out of it. So in practice, that allows us to, um, to overcome um, uh, type erasure and in the... Um, in this kind of code, instead of having to write, um, okay, so instead of having to write post class .java, okay, uh, this colon colon class .java is not super nice, so it's I think it's better to this kind of notation leveraging the generic type parameters is quite usual in Kotlin, less in, 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 in Java, but you can see that it's, it's read, uh, it read better. Uh, I think we are okay. Um, you can see here the not, this is also an extension. You see that in the, um, in the Kotlin DSL, what I do is that I am adding a not operator to uh, request predicates to be able to negate that with this kind of syntax. Um, DSL in Kotlin uh, are less powerful than in Scala, and that's on purpose, because uh, I don't want to... That's a certain level of fancy stuff, and maybe when you come from Java, you say, ooh, <laughs> that's strange. Uh, but we can't do anything, and we, we, we are limited, and we can't do uh, super strange um, uh, DSL like in Scala, so there is less less power, less flexibility here, but that, that's on purpose. We want to keep that in control. And um, yeah, that's the uh, most fancy stuff that you can do, I think, with this kind of uh, DSL. I will, so I have a talk Wednesday, a um, little bit of advertising, when I, I will go more in detail about all the features that we support in Spring Data K, Spring Boot 2, and Spring Framework, and I will show uh, um, a bin declaration DSL that allow to declare bins with um, uh, uh, an addi addi additional DSL. We provide two DSL in, in Spring Framework 5, this one for the routing and the other one for the bin declaration. And I will also talk about the um, co-routing support, which allow to basically, so this is a community project, but it allows to leverage the Webflux um, uh, stack while keeping an imperative programming. So basically, when it can allow you to migrate a Spring MVC application to the non-blocking framework, with just keeping the same programming model. I, wi I will show that Wednesday, so you are free to come to see the talk. And I think uh, we are done. Do you see another thing we could show? Okay. So uh, do you have any question? We have a little bit, uh, so some time left. Uh, is there any question about this second part? Yeah. Yeah, to the router. So there can be some improvement that, for example, this login is not kind of string that is then looked at in the, in the controller, so you've got more, more safety there. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, here we have tried to, uh, to keep the same uh, logic that in um, uh, Spring MVC uh, uh, at request mapping, and uh, indeed, maybe we, we 
could uh, we could provide that on, in even more type safe way. So there is maybe improvement uh, possible. Uh, an interesting thing is that this DSL you can extend it yourself. I mean, if for example, um, for example, for the future it's not done yet, but we are discussing with Rob Winch about adding security uh, feature in that. That way we specify directly uh, security in the DSL to say, okay, uh, this part with a nested uh, block, this part will be protected by basic OAuth, this one is protected by OAuth, for example, this kind of thing. This is not done, not done yet, but you can also extend it uh, for your purpose. Uh, it's, it's possible. But yeah, good, good, good idea. Maybe there is something to do there. Another question? Yeah. How does the debugging look like? With the reactive stuff? Yeah. yeah, so debugging is definitively harder because um, with, the reactive, uh, with the reactive stack, basically, um, uh, you we are using reactive APIs in a non blocking way, and the stack that we have, for example, are, are much harder to debug. So, reactive stack is not a. Uh, yeah, providing a non blocking reactive uh, web stack is not a free lunch. What we provide uh, to make that easier is that by default, the stack trace mode of Reactor is enabled. That stack trace mode is a feature of Reactor which is enabled by default uh, in local with the Spring Boot um, um, uh, dev extensions, which allow to basically, uh, when you have an exception thrown, it allows you to go to the, 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 the source that produces this exception. Because by default, with uh, reactive and non blocking runtimes, you basically just have a uh, and asynchronous uh, schedulers, and you, you can't see when there is an exception what causes that. Uh, with the stack trace mode available only in dev mode, that's, that's possible. It has a cost in terms of performance, that's why we all only enable that uh, on development. Uh, we are thinking with Stefan Maldini and Simon Basfe from the reactor team to provide even more uh, stack trace cleanup to have more nice looking, uh, um, nice looking stack. Uh, also, we need to, I think, finely tune the, um, when there is a, an uncatch exception in Webflux. Uh, I guess we can do also some uh, stack trace cleanup uh, on that. Um, we are also have in mind, it's not developed yet, but um, basically, uh, Reactor, Flux, and Mono expose some metadata in JSON, for example, if you want, and uh, we have some prototype of. Um, um, reactive dashboard that allow to debug your streams uh, in live. So the, we can build, for example, a React application or Angular dashboard that allow to see that there is too much data uh, on a part which is blocked on the stream and there is too much data in a buffer and debug that uh, visually. So that's things that we are that uh, are expected in the future. Uh, uh, not here already, but yeah, currently with the the stack trace mode, uh, and yeah, we will try to work with ID, also provide some kind of um, helpers to debug uh, streams, for example. There is some ongoing work to improve uh, debugging experience, but that's, that's a good point. When you are using a reactive, um, a reactive stack, the debugging is, is harder. Yeah, so the SQL support question. Um, yeah, good one. So in Spring Data K, we provide native reactive support, re non-blocking uh, support for every database that provides us uh, such a uh, low-level driver. That means that we provide reactive support for MongoDB, for Redis, for Cassandra, and for Coachbase. Uh, we currently do not provide specific support for other uh, non-reactive drivers, and a big part of that is the SQL databases. You can you can use that. Uh, I have not shown that, but you can basically create a thread pools and use regular GDBC blocking drivers. And by doing that trick, you can use a reactive API with the new Webflux framework. That's not something we promote as a first uh, class use case for now because. Um, yeah, we already had a lot of things to do with uh, uh, new reactive stuff. And since there is an ongoing discussion about async GDBC, which is a very long-term topic, but recently at Java 1, 
it seems to there is a revival of that question. So there is currently discussion on uh, a mailing list with Oracle guys which are working on async GDBC, which could be a nice basis to provide uh, a reactive uh, access to uh, SQL databases. And that's basically ongoing uh, experimentation and process. And even for Oracle, that's the very early days of that. So we, we prefer to say, OK, there is some open question. How do you support transaction with a reactive in, the, in a reactive world? Uh, for example, we need to, to change our current thread local based uh, transactional support to something that will be based on uh, reactive API. So be aware that reactor supports a context. Uh, context could be used as a replacement theoretically to deal with transaction, with security, and we are working on that, but that's not ready yet. So we prefer to, to weigh there is support for low level, instead of providing some kind of trick with this uh, thread local, which will still consume a lot of threads, we prefer to work uh, and, and, and to, to, to work and discuss about async GDBC support, see how far uh, that goes, and eventually after leverage that, uh, rather than uh, providing some super early half-baked uh, uh, SQL support. Other question? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, in Spring MVC, we can write tests with mock MVC. Um, in uh, Spring Web Flux, uh, we have um, something called uh, Web Test Client, which is the equivalent. Sadly, this is the only and single API we can't use for now in Kotlin <laughs> because there is an issue, a type inference issue uh, in Kotlin 1, even 1.2. Uh, I push very hard to get that fixed in Kotlin 1.3. So have a look in the Spring Framework um, uh, documentation. There is a, a dedicated section to web test client, which is uh, an even more powerful and easy to use alternative to mock MVC. Uh, it's currently super nice to use that in, in Java. And in Kotlin, it will be, I guess, when Kotlin 1.3 will be released, I, I guess, nex next year. But for now, uh, so that's, that's why it, uh, web, uh, web test client is usable in, in a mock or non mock context. Um, you see that? Migrate to web test client when this horrible bug wi will be fixed. So <laughs> uh, if, uh, when uh, Kotlin 1.3 will be here, and if they fix that, and uh, I will do my best to get that fixed, you can use um, web test client which provide you um, basically a, a very close uh, API. Um, it's like web, web client, but you have uh, some, um, uh, you can assert uh, that a body has some JSON content. You have high level features to check that there is uh, headers and things like that. So you have assertions, uh, you have a high level assertions to test uh, that. And uh, when you use the mock a mode, it directly tests the functional uh, or non-functional, the, the Webflux handlers, without going through the network. And you can also use that uh, to for your regular integration tests. So that's uh, basically, the since we have built uh, the client and the server together, we have made a special mode where uh, basically we can mock easily the client to not go through the network and provide some high-level assertions. Okay, I think we are done. So uh, you can go to my talk Wednesday afternoon if you want more details about the rest of the support, uh, about coroutines, about various other stuff. And um, thanks for being here. Thanks.